Oh, now we're moving uh, back again in the textbook into chapter 5. Chapter 5 is about inventory control and management when demand is uncertain. And as we kind of have discussed before, uncertainty is more the, the normal situation than the exception. So in most situations there will be a certain amount of uncertainty related to our demand forecasts. And uh, hi, hi. and the idea then is to try to change our models to kind of take this uncertainty into account. And the methods we use will then be typically probabilistic, meaning that we introduce uncertainty through probabilistic means in our models. So we, we add information not only about what is uncertain, but in, in which way it is uncertain, so to speak, by using probability functions, processes, distributions, or whatever. That is what's underlying here. Uh, one question that could come up in, in uh, when you start dealing with uncertainty is whether these non-uncertain or deterministic models, as we tend to call them, we have kind of learned already, is useless. I would say definitely no. Uh, many reasons for that. Uh, handling uncertainty is, is first difficult. Okay, it's, it kind of imposes much more complexity in both formulating our problems as well as solving them, especially the last category, I would say, because typically it has a tendency to kind of blow up our problems size-wise. And we are more than ever uh, typically dependent on heuristics for solution in, in practical situations. The other problem with uncertainty is that we have to generate much more information into our problems. Now it's not just enough with a single number for a cost, but we kind of need to have a distribution about that cost. And that distribution could mean gathering a lot more information. It could also impose certain incentive problems, meaning that if somebody solves a model in an organization which has uncertainties in the probabilistic sense, then there could, could be a lot of disagreement on what kind of probabilities are right. If you talk about talk with salespeople, they are normally very optimistic. They say, okay, we will sell a lot about all, all this new product. It will be a great success. That will kind of reflect their view of what kind of probabilities are to be put on future demand. They will typically have a high probability for very high future demand numbers and smaller probabilities on low future demand numbers. Other people in the organization who are more, should we say, conservative or maybe even more realistic, would have different views. In many cases, getting a simple single number for a cost is either kind of looking up somewhere, finding it, or kind of making a judgment, or maybe even computing an average. But if you don't disagree on the observations you actually have, you cannot, you cannot disagree on an average, can you? That's not possible. Either you compute it correctly or you don't. But when you introduce uncertainty in, in the probabilistic sense, then it kind of opens up for a certain possibility for disagreeing. If you think about those who are to construct a cost estimate for the Olympics, which Norway are discussing on whether to propose for in 2022, you would perhaps expect that those who really want this to take place, they mi might have a different view on the cost estimate than those who do not want it. And these kind of problems are immediately coming when you start uh, dealing with uncertainty in models. And uh, they are very hard to solve. So that is the reason why we still kind of, uh, in many situations, stick to deterministic models, because they kind of avoid many of these type of problems. They are easier to solve, you don't need so much information, you don't have to disagree so much on what you do and what you don't. And of course, finally, these 
deterministic models could in many cases be used as building blocks in more complex stochastic or probabilistic models. The term stochastic means probabilistic, if you don't know, it kind of means the same. It means basically that there's something is described by probabilities in our models. So a stochastic or a probabilistic model is a model where certain elements are, are uncertain and are described by probabilities. In that sense, of course, it is a question of what you know about probabilities. You see some terms here, histograms, expected value, variance, discrete and continuous probability densities, distribution functions, integrals. How many of you have heard about int integrals? You have, Jonas, Maria, Joe, okay, half of there, that's good. So what is an integral then, Jonas? <laughs> uh, it looks like this, doesn't it? And then we have a certain function, and then we use this term dx to kind of state that we want, this is the variable we want to integrate on. Uh, technically speaking, integrals are not so hard, okay? They, they kind of just is the opposite of derivatives. So if I have a function, I can, t uh, let me, maybe we should take this one. Then I can take the derivative of this function. That would be 2 times x, wouldn't it? That is the derivative of x squared. And if the integral is the opposite, it should mean, shouldn't it, that the integral of the function 2x dx then should equal x squared. Okay? As simple as that. It's just the opposite way of doing things. Unfortunately, performing integration is not as easy as performing differentiation. It's much more difficult. Fortunately, however, doing it numerically is very easy. So if you're looking for numbers here, not only symbols, then it's relatively easy to do it. Uh, but we will return to integrals. Okay, let's start, start from the beginning here. I think we start looking by an, on an example. That example is under put under um, b -b 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 added material here, and it's uh, perhaps, perhaps example 5.1 in the textbook. Okay, so let's start there. Could we blow it up a little bit? Is this too much? Ah, it should be possible to see. So this is an example. On consecutive Sundays, Mac, the owner of a local newsstand, purchases a number of copies of the Computer Journal, a popular weekly magazine, uh, and he pays 25 cents for each copy and sells each for 75 cents. This seems like a good deal, doesn't it? You kind of get a nice profit here, actually 300 percent. That's not bad, is it? Uh, probably this is not very realistic. Copies he has not sold during the week can be returned to his supplier for 10 cents each. So he has a kind of, these copies have a so-called salvage value. You can kind of return them and get something, typically less than what you buy them for. If that value had been higher, then you could, 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 could produce a money pump, couldn't you? Then you just could buy an infinite amount of magazines and return an infinite amount, sitting back with an infinite profit. So that, that's kind of obvious, isn't it, that these number 10 must be smaller than 25, okay? And of course, for this to make any sense, this number 75 must be larger than 25, okay? A negative profit in the first place would make no sense. So we, there is a kind of link here, okay? These, these 20, 10 must be smaller than 25, which again must be smaller than 75, okay? This kind of link must, must be there when we put symbols into, this, into these numbers. Okay, so far, so good. Now this Mac, he has kind of been observing the number of copies he has sold in different weeks the previous year. So in this table here, it's 52 instances, or 52 observations, of weekly sales in the previous year. You see in the first week, 15 copies were sold, and the second week, 19, no, so maybe it's going this way, yeah, 19, and then 9, and so on. Okay, so there's a lot of different numbers here, which are actually observed sales values for these 
product in the previous year. There is no discernible pattern to the, these data, meaning that if you kind of plot them in a time series frame, you kind of don't see any trend or systematic behavior or whatever. You, you could perhaps expect that that at certain weekdays, maybe Fridays, we, we could sell a little bit more of these magazines, but according to, to the text here, we, we don't see these patterns at all. So it is difficult to predict the demand for the journal in any given week. However, as it says, we can represent the demand experience of this item as a frequency histogram. Uh, so let's start there. How do we build a histogram based on a set of data? Okay, that is a straightforward thing to do. What we do then is that we kind of count up the number of different sales and construct a graph. Okay, let's start. We make up a graph here and we have to, of course, to put all the possible outcomes which we can have here. We see, for instance, here that we have a zero here, don't we? So a certain week we sold no copies. Okay, so that is something, and it could be one, and two, and three, and four, and it moves on up all to the maximal point here, which is uh, uh, 19, perhaps? Am I right? S no, 22. 22, yeah. It seems 22 is the biggest number here, so we can stop at 22 up here. That is enough. Okay, there's no observations after that point. And then, uh, to build this histogram, very simple, we just count up. And we just kind of make some kind of image of our counts. The normal thing is to kind of build a kind of um, rectangle for the counts. Alternatively, we can use crosses, for instance. I tend to use that if I do it manually. So there's a single observation in zero here, isn't it? So there's a, a one cross there. There is no observations on one, no observations on two, no on three, but there is some of four here, as you can see. There is one here two and three. So there are three fours. So four has a frequency distribution, if you like, on four here. One, maybe you should do it like this. One, two, three. Okay, then we get this. And we move on. Do we have any fives here, sevens? We can look at a different number. Maybe let's see what we have here. Which could be a lot. Eleven seems to be many. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, okay, we see we have 1, 2, 3, mm, 4, I'm only able to find 4, but I'm, uh, my sight is bad, 1, 2, 3, that covers the two first lines, Lower. no 11s here, and then there are 2, yeah, it's 5, so then we get 5, So this is one way of showing off this data, isn't it? It kind of tells us something, how the data are. And if you look a little bit longer down on the page here, you see they have done this in the textbook. So here you count up the frequency of each different sale, and you kind of make a graph like this. And you see it kind of has some kind of gravity in the middle here, and there's less on the sides, okay? This is perhaps what you would expect. And on most days, they have kind of regular customers, so we had a kind of steady sale, but in some, some situations, some people may be sick and whatever, then you get less sales. But roughly, you get kind of a, a fairly constant sale in the middle here, but there's still some uncertainty here. Now, the next step is to convert this histogram into a probability distribution. Do you know how to do that? Again, very simple. These frequencies are numbers which are larger than, than one typically, okay? We have a frequency of one here, we have a frequency of three here, we have a frequency of six here, or nine. When we construct the probability density, we just kind of divide by the total number of observations to get it all into probabilities. So if you take all weeks, there are 52 of them, and divide each of these numbers by 52, we would get the corresponding probability density. And this is a discrete probability density, as we call it. You probably recall that when we talked about tossing a coin, we had a kind of a two-point distribution. Either we get a coin 
probability over half, we get heads or tails. Then we have only two probabilities, but in this case, of course, there will be more. Okay? There will be actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, ten, two, twenty-three, wouldn't it? From zero up to and including twenty, twenty-two. So that would be what we refer to as the 23-point distribution. So this point kind of tells us how many probabilities do we assign. And in practice, we can kind of do this as we like. We can kind of condense it by putting intervals together here, if you like, saying that the probability that we sell between 4 and 8, for instance, has a certain probability, instead of kind of splitting these into each category. So this is kind of convenience which defines how we do it. So in order to get to a probability density here, you just divide each of these squares by 52, producing a new set of numbers. And these new set of numbers will typically all be less than 1, wouldn't they? If I divide each of these numbers by 52, no number is as big as 52 here, so obviously all numbers will be less than 1. And of course in the extreme case, if there's only a single number, that would be 1. Okay, that, then it would be certain, because if you... If in all weeks you had observed that we sell 9, then you would probably expect that the same would happen next year. <laughs> okay. So a discrete probability density or distribution It contains this P1 up to some number, let's say Pn, and each of these P's are kind of, dis are kind of linked to an outcome. O1, On. These are outcomes. These are probabilities. Of course, the outcomes in this case is the number of magazines we sell in a week. So if you take this first number here, which is, has a value of 1, then of course we get the probability of 1 divided by 52, and that tells us in this case that the probability of selling 0 magazines is 1 over 52. If we believe, of course, that this representation also works next year. This assumption is of course crucial. If we don't, then there's not really no point in this at all. There is something we could say about these probabilities, isn't it? They must sum to 1. If you add them together over all the i's, they should always equal 1. That is obvious, isn't it? If you look at the numbers here, there are 52 observations. We kind of distribute by dividing by 52, and if we add all together, of course, then we get 52 over 52, which is 1. So that is kind of happening. Alternatively, we can think about it that if we toss the coin, either it becomes head or it becomes tail. Of course, then there's, that is the only two options we have in reality. And of course, the probability that it either will be a head or a tail is one. Okay, that's, there's no, we don't accept this option of the coin standing on, on the side. So that is some si kind of basic here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit. Uh, I don't. I, I don't agree with myself on the sequence here. <laughs> uh, I see on my notes. Um, okay. Let's look at look at averages. One thing we obviously can do with this kind of figure is to put the kind of curve through here. We can do that, can't we? We can kind of put something which kind of 
resembles our observations as good as possible. And if you had more observations, probably the curve would fit even better. So when we have a discrete distribution, we could also introduce a continuous distribution. A continuous distribution is some kind of function which describes the probabilistic phenomena which are of interest to us. Basically, there are two ways to proceed. No other, we can kind of take observations and kind of use the observations like we did here and try to fit the curve which fits them nicely. Or alternatively, we could say, okay, we assume that the mechanism we look at could follow a given distribution, which we already kind of have defined. And there is one very central probability distribution in statistics, which you probably heard about, which is referred to as the normal distribution. Have you heard about that? Yeah, slightly. There is a reason why normal distribution is important. Do you know why? Perhaps not. It's actually a fairly ugly mathematical expression. I don't know if you have seen it. No, you have? Yeah, it's kind of ugly, isn't it? It's uh, there is an exponential and there is some x minus my squared over sigma and there's something. I wonder if it's like this. I seem to recall it's like this, or at least close to it. So it's, it's, it's not a nice expression, so why the hell do we keep working on these bad expressions? And of course there is a reason, and the reason is that it turns out that some mathematicians many years ago proved that if we take kind of numbers which are drawn from certain other distributions than the normal distributions and add them together, then in the long run, given that we kind of take an infinite amount of numbers, it turns out that the resulting distribution is normal. So this normal distribution is kind of the mother of all probability distributions. It kind of captures all kinds of random phenom phenomena if you kind of take it to the limit. So that is the main reason why it's important. And it kind of pops up in many situations due to this, of course. The shape is not so far from what we see here. It kind of looks like this. It has infinite tails. There is more in the middle than on the ends. So it's a fairly small probability of hand coming up here, but big probability here. All kind of human phenomena like height and weight and everything is typically like this. You have those who are fat and those who are thin. and most people are in the middle, okay? So you kind of can argue that this seems to be a representation which is, is fairly normal in, in, in nature. So, so that is kind of the background, okay? So to averages. Now let's make an uh, experiment. We toss, toss coin again. Either we get head or tail, okay? And if we get head, we get one dollar. If we get tail, we get two dollars, okay? A nice game, isn't it? Always positive, okay? So everybody would like to be here for free. The question is, what would you pay to take a part of this game then, okay? And suppose you want to base your decision on average, okay? Then we need to kind of find the average of this game. Now we know what the probabilities are. We get this with probability over half, and this with probability over half. So we're interested in the average. One way of finding this average is kind of performing this experiment. Okay, we can start tossing the coin, and then we get, then we get the head, which produces one as the outcome. We get another head, one, maybe even a third head. Who knows? Then suddenly there is a tail two tails, head again, then two tails, and we keep on like this, okay? And of course, in the long run, it should be half-half, shouldn't it? That is what we mean by this. But of course, in the really long run. But let's make it simple here now. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So now we are kind of 
thinking, we have performed our experiment. Of course, now we can compute the average, can't we? Because now we have put numbers here. There is one, two, three, four, five, six ones. So this will be one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one which is one, two, three, four, six. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six twos. Plus two. Two, three, four, five, six. And of course we have to divide by the number of experiments we perform here, which is 12, isn't it? Six plus six. So then we get, then we get, what do we get? Then we get six by the first ones plus 12 by the final once and we divide this by 12, don't we? This is 18 over 12, which is uh, 1.5, isn't it? Should be. It should be 1.5, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. But of course, if we are kind of, we, we would expect that immediately, wouldn't we? Yeah. But, but there is a point behind this now. If, if I write this slightly differently, okay, I can write it like this. There is 6 times 1. This is the outcome of one of the events. And there is 6 times 2, which is the other outcome. And we should divide this by 12. Of course, we can write this fraction slightly different by taking 6 divided by 12 and multiply by 1 and 6 divided by 12 and multiply by 2. So a different way of computing the average is to compute it by formulating probabilities because this is the probability of getting head and this is the probability of getting tail, isn't it? So instead of kind of performing observing values, I can use a distribution to compute the average. If I use a distribution when I compute the average we have a different name on the average. In that case, we call it the expected value. It means exactly the same, but it's, it refers to the fact that then we have a kind of distribution underlying used to compute the average or the kind of a, the typical value, if you like. So this expected value is found then by summing up our PIs and XIs, given that X is the outcome. And this is the classical formula for a discrete expected value. Unfortunately, when we deal with the newsboy problem, we have to deal with continuous distributions, at least to make it understandable at all, I think. Then we have to return to the integral. Okay. We could also say here, Maybe you should take that later on, okay. There is another, let me do it now, there is another measure than the expected or average, referred to as the variance or distribution. And this variance is a measure on how tight the distribution is. This kind of distribution has a small variance this kind of distribution has a big variance. So the variance tells you kind of how certain are you on the expected value. Here you are fairly certain. Okay, you're kind of narrow, but here it's kind of a big gap. So here the variance should be big. So the variance could perhaps be computed by taking a certain value, subtract the average, and square to get rid of the problems we discussed when we discussed linear regression, okay? To get rid of this, to kind of avoid them kind of cancelling it out, out each other. So if you add these together, overall possible observations, now we're kind of looking at that. We tend to call the average a descriptive value, and this is kind of a distributional value, okay? So there are two kind of different values here. Here we, here we we, we compute it by taking 1 over n times the sum of xi. Here we use these formula, different formulas, obviously. They need different input. Here we have a set of numbers. Here we have a distribution. 
of course, also a set of numbers, but still a distribution. The same kind of thing is, 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 is present when we think about variance. So we can kind of have a similar type of, of thing here, which is summing up this and taking some kind of average. Unfortunately, it turns out that we have to divide by n minus 1 here. I will not go into the reason for that. That is, has to do with uh, something referred to as, yeah, it has to do with the expected value of, of this term. And uh, it turns out that, that if we take the expected value of this term, it produces the expected correct result. But if there's only one over n, then it's, there's an error. So it's kind of to, 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 to make it work, so to speak. Of course, if n is big, it doesn't really matter, does it? The difference between 1 over n and 1 over n minus 1 is, is not there, at least. If there's hundreds of thousands, it doesn't matter. So, so it's not a big thing. Corresponding to this, in the, should we say, in the obs observed manner, there is a theoretical term here. It looks like this. Uh, yeah, it looks like this. So again, you see the kind of structure here. We kind of do not have the piece when we kind of just compute either either this estimated variance or this estimated average. So we have to kind of introduce the, the probabilities to make it work. And to confuse, to confuse you even further, there is also continuous versions of these ones. And then you have to use an integral here. Similarly here. Okay, this is probably not so easy to understand unless you know it already. And we don't have to time to go into this in real detail. But moving from a discrete into a continuous situation should be kind of understandable. What we do then is that we construct a function here, some kind of f of x representing our distribution. And of course, if you understand the kind of correspondence between a sum and an integral, this is not so hard to see, really. Because if you have heard about this in the mathematics, you've probably seen that the area under a certain function could be described as this integral. So if this is a and this is b, you take the integral from a to b of this function here, f of x, turns out to be this area here. If you think that we kind of split this smooth function into just points, then of course the area will kind of be adding together these infinite points, these very small peaks here. So you just add them together. So you see there's a, a correspondence between adding and integrating. So you can think about when you move from a discrete into a continuous world, you can kind of replace summation signs by integrals. And this pi here, of course, which is the probabilities of these discrete points, must then be replaced by a function, which is representing the same type of information. This f of x is called a probability density. Then city. And of course, this x refers to the same one as before, but now it's kind of moving continuously along the line. Of course, to be able to compute all these things, you have to know how to do this, okay? But at the moment, I don't think we need to bother with that. So basically, in probability, there are kind of three different group of measures. Either you measure related to observations, in that case you use on the left here, or you, in these two latter cases, you measure related to a density or kind of some kind of description or the probabilistic mechanism, it could be discrete on the left here, or continuous on the right here. And, and as I said, there is a kind of obvious logic in between. Unfortunately, it's not always something that modern students learn.
I don't know why, but it's kind of been taken out of some curriculums around the world, maybe because it's kind of considered difficult. But in any case, if we want to use this in the logistics setting we plan to do here, we need to actually know a little bit about it. One nice thing about using a distribution in a continuous manner, like for instance the normal density. Okay, maybe we should take, before I take that, I'll do a little bit more here, okay? Let's return to our figure here. It's kind of moved a little bit far now. Let's, okay. Now, if you think this is, of course, as I said, just a frequency diagram, but it's easy to kind of convert it into a probability density by just dividing by 52. So, um, if we would ask the following question what is the probability that we sell 14 units in a certain week next year based on the fact that we assume that this distribution is correct, okay, that represents what will happen in any future week. Then we'll have to go into here and look at 14 and see, okay, uh, 14, we have observed 5 14, haven't we? There is uh, 14 is here and it's 5. Yeah, it seems to be 5. So the probability of this should then be 5 over 52, shouldn't it? Suppose I ask another question. What is the probability that we sell at least 14 units in a given week next year? Of course, in that case, we can sell 0 which has a probability of 1 over 52. We can sell 0 here, which could just add to that, or we can sell, sell uh, 4, which is 3 over 52. We could sell 5, which is 1 over 52, and so on, up to and including 14. And then we would have to add all these probabilities together to find that probability, wouldn't we? So this would be, this would be 1 over 52 plus um, 3 over 52, plus and so on. In many cases we can express these sums as a function by itself. That function also has a name, it's called the distribution function, where we just accumulate the probabilities. Let's look at the example in this case now. I don't read the text here, just look at the numbers. Okay, here we kind of constructed both the probability density and the distribution function. The distribution function often is named with a big F, distribution function. And the small f is the density, or the, uh, yeah, typically the density. Either the density function or the probability density. The density function is continuous, probability density is discrete. So it's different names here. So the f of q is 1 over 52, 3 over 52, and so on, as we discussed, it kind of moves up, and then this f of q just adds together. So you start adding this to what you have already, which is nothing, which is 1, and then you add nothing, then it pops up to 4 and, and keeps on running. And of course, in the end, it should be 1, shouldn't it, as we discussed. And these functions, they kind of typically look a bit different than the densities, don't they? There is the link between them. Our density may look like this, while our f would look something like, yeah, what would it look like? Something like this, perhaps. And at least it kind of stops at 1 here, okay? because it always will end up being 1. So it adds together all everything. It has some kind of pattern, maybe something like that. Typically, kind of almost an S-shape. S So if you plot, if you make a plot of these numbers, this plot, it will of course be the same as the previous figure. 
and produce this histogram, while this FOQ will produce some spikes here, it follows this kind of pattern. If we move into this world, we can compute this big F function or the distribution function by performing an integral. Let's look at uh, this one first. Now, suppose we have a certain probability density, we integrate it over a certain space, let's call that space omega for instance, then this operation should correspond doing this operation and then we should know the answer to be 1, shouldn't we? So if we take the integral over a given probability density, it should always be 1 because it has the same logic as adding together a discrete probability density. What do you think? If we have values ranging from 0 in this case up to selling 14 or this fx dx, what do you think this should be mean? Now we're adding together probabilities only up to 14, not over the whole area. Here we're adding probabilities over the whole range and then we should end up with 1. But now we will obviously not end up with 1 because there is there is something left after 14, isn't it? This part is not taken care of. So we add together all probabilities up to and including 14, which should mean that this kind of operation produces a probability. A probability that we sell from 0 up to and including 14. Okay? Yeah. So we can comp compute probabilities if we have this fx. If we put a variable instead of the number here, let's call that one capital Q, then of course depending on what value Q is, we'll get different values. So we should end up with a function and that is what we refer to as the distribution function, which of course then will be the gradual accumulated probability as we move along. Now I think we have the necessities almost, okay, almost. If, as I started previously, let me just take that now, okay? If we have a distribution, say it's the normal distribution, there's a lot of different distributions. Normally it's only one, okay? Maybe it was like this. I don't remember really if it's two times the square root of pi or if it's the square root of two times pi. It's really not very important, okay? But the point here is that this function has two parameters. This one is called sigma square, and this one is called my. This is the expected value of the distribution, and this is the variance. So if we believe that what we're dealing here with here is actually following a normal distribution, if you have some, either somebody tells this to us, I tell it to you, or somebody else, or whatever, then it's very easy to estimate the distribution, as we say. Because the only, only unknowns in this di distribution, apart from the actual value unknown, are these two parameters. Pi is, as you probably know, 3.14 in a lot of numbers. So we know that one. So this sigma square is the variance, and my is the expected value. So if we have a set of numbers now, like the numbers we had in this example, actually like these numbers on top here, we can easily find an estimate on the expected value, can't we? By just taking the average of these numbers, that produces one number. And then we can find the variance by the formula I wrote up, which was 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of xi minus x bar squared. This is also easy to, compl to, 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 to compute. And then I have these two parameters, and then I kind of define my distribution. And then I can start using it, finding probabilities why something is smaller than other thing or whatever. And that is what is kind of neat with these functional descriptions or probabilistic mechanisms, because they, in most cases, almost all of these distributions are kind of defined when we have the expected value and the variance. There are certain distributions who need more than these two, but the most are kind of fixed. For instance, the exponential distribution, 
is solely defined only by the expected value. So there is a point by this, okay? Now the next step is to try to take this into our logistic problem and try to formulate a model where, which kind of resembles the situation we have described here. Somebody buys at a certain price, sells at a certain higher price, and has the pos possibility of returning at a price lower than the original uh, buying price, and are uncertain on how many objects they will sell. And the problem they need to, do to, to find then is how many items to buy. Okay. okay? Just a little bit before we take the break, okay? Sorry about this. I don't seem able to finish now, okay? Now let's look at the example again. Moving back to the example. In the example, the average demand was close to 12, I think, or maybe it was 11.77 or something, I don't really remember. It's probably not 12. It doesn't matter, let's say it's 12, okay? What is interesting for us is how much to order, okay? One obvious, simple, Suggestion could be to order this number. Okay, we could order the average demand. Okay, let us order average demand. If our distribution, as it looks like here, has a kind of symmetry around 12. It's the same amount of mass here as here. It should mean that the probability that our real demand is lower than 12 is a half. And the probability that our real demand is larger than 12 should also be a half. Agree? If it's symmetric. It kind of looks fairly symmetric here, even though we, we really don't know it. But according to the textbook, it is fairly. Meaning that if you add together all the areas under 12 and above 12, it kind of almost the same area. Now let's look at this. With the probability equal to half then, we will end up with too many magazines. You agree? If you accept the kind of a symmetry here, same probability density on each type part of 12, of course, either way, we could rule out the case that we will sell exactly 12, okay? That is, uh, that is too, 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 too little uh, probable here. So, um, in that case, we get too many magazines. Now, if, if this uh, Mac here, if he buy, uh, buys uh, b b b one magazine, which remains unsold. In that case, there is a loss, isn't it? In that case, he pays 25, buying it. He gets 10, returning it, and he ends up with a loss of 15. Okay, this is his loss. Alternatively, with the same probability, he ends up buying too few magazines. Ends up, we don't need to use buyer, to a few magazines. If he buys a single magazine, magazine too little, buys one magazine too little, Then he also incurs a loss, doesn't he? Because then he could have sold one more, and if he had sold more, one more, he would get 75 for a price of 25, 
which produces a loss of 50. Okay. So you see, we can immediately say here that this guy Mac, he should perhaps avoid this more than he avoids that. So he should not order the average amount. He should order somewhat above our average amount due to the structure of the costs here. And the question is, of course, how much above? How should we find that? You see this argument, it's kind of the same that happens in air transport. You probably know that they use overbooking actively in air transport. You know what overbooking is? You sell more tickets than seats. Do they use that in events? Sometimes they do. Okay, we have heard these stories. In most cases it doesn't matter because there's always somebody who doesn't show up. And of course in that case it's always a nice thing to kind of have re reserves that can come in and take the seats. So this is basically about overbooking, okay, and how to do overbooking. And this is obviously an important topic in event planning. So that is the reason why we spend some time on this, okay. So this kind of situation, you need to know how much of a certain good to buy based on a kind of uncertain demand future in a kind of one point situation. You don't store it further on, you it's just a single type of, you can think about selling Christmas trees. This is like the, that, this, isn't it? I want to sell Christmas trees before Christmas. There's a certain week that I can sell. I need to decide before this week how many Christmas trees to buy. Okay, if I buy too many, I have some left. What do I do with those? Okay, I can chop them up and make wood. Probably not earning anything. A very small salvage value, just similar like this situation. Bread, the same, isn't it? Fresh bread, baked this day, is uh, good, can be sold at a reasonable price. One day old, not so good. Two day olds, even worse, three day olds, maybe you shouldn't sell it at all. Okay, so you have this kind of situation in many instances, especially when there is perishable goods, goods which kind of change their value as time goes on. Okay, then it's about time for a break. We meet again in 15 minutes, five minutes, two, half, Three. Yeah. Okay. So the, this last argument was just kind of to make you understand that we kind of it's not as simple as just hitting the, the midpoint here. We, we need to think a little bit more.